Hello, welcome to All About Kids. My name is Pepper Wolf, and I'm a bookseller at the Red Bloom Bookshop and a children's librarian. We're here today with David Wisniewski, a children's author and illustrator, and he's here to share some of our, his books with us and his drawings and artwork. Welcome. Well, thank you. Um, I, my first question would be is, what brought you to the children's book world? What, how did you get started? Well, I've had a, a very circuitous route into this. I didn't plan to get into children's books at all. Um, when I graduated from uh, high school, uh, I ended up not having enough money for college afterward. And I heard about the Ringling Brothers uh, Clown College that the circus runs. And by that time, I was interested in theater. And uh, I signed up for it, and I got in. And um, I went through the eight-week training course and graduated. And I was good enough to get a job there. So I spent two years with Ringling, and then one year with a tent show called Circus Vargas out in California. And then when I got off the show, needed a job, got hired by a puppet theater where I met my wife, Donna, and uh, started doing shadow puppetry, where you uh, cut the puppets out. They're like flat, jointed figures that you operate against a white screen. And doing that year after year taught me how to cut. And then we had kids, and we couldn't tour anymore, at least not for a while when they were babies. So I had to find a different way of making a living. And I started doing cut paper uh, silhouettes at first and then adding color. And then uh, after three years of uh, freelance illustration, I got the f chance to do a first book. Oh, OK. How many years ago was that? Uh, ten years ago now, when dinosaurs oh. rule the earth. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, I just have a question about you being a clown. Mm -hmm. will, will you just tell us a little bit what you did as a clown? You... Well, um, you're one of maybe 25 or so that uh, travel with uh, each unit of the Ringling Show. There are two units, a red and a blue. I was on the one with a guy named Gunther Gable Williams, who was a well-known animal trainer. Uh, he's since retired now. Shows how long ago this is, 25 years <coughs> now. Um, but uh, you have about maybe, oh, 12, 13 appearances in a show. Uh, at Ringling, a lot of your stuff is basically being a chorus boy. You know, you ride the elephants, you twirl the girls on the rope, and. And, and all that type of stuff. And you don't have a whole lot of time to do your own comedy material. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what was kind of nice about joining a tent show, is that uh, um, you have much more chances to, uh, to do your own stuff. And also, I thought it was kind of a nicer atmosphere, too, because in a tent show, when it rains, everybody gets wet. Yeah. <laughs> Including Including you. me, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, but there were some interesting things happened. Like one time we were in California, it had been raining for a, like a week. And, you know, a tent show sets up on a lot. And so everybody was getting ready to leave. They finished the last show. Everybody started up their, their, uh, their vans and their, their fifth wheels, you know, their trailers. And all of the axles just sank right into the mud, you know, couldn't go anywhere. So the guy who runs the elephants took out the elef one of the elephants, wrapped a chain around the bumpers, pulled everybody out. You know? So it was the first time, you know, like I had a AAA experience with an elephant, you know, which yeah. was pretty neat. But well, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. So, so you basically were kind of a goofy kid growing up? I mean, No, actually, I was a pretty serious kid growing up. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I, I actually read quite a bit, and uh, I was a good student in school. Um, uh, my mom's uh, British and has a, a great sense of humor. Uh, and my dad, for a military man, a 30-year military man, actually has a, a good sense of humor, too. And he's, he's not really a, you know, a, a really strict type. And he end, they ended up having, you know, three sons all in the arts. Um, mm. But um, it was the performance angle of things. I, I liked performing. And, and if you're going to be a circus clown, well, you better be funny. Yeah, OK. Mm. Well, you had mentioned um, your dad was in Army. You were an Army? Air Force. Air Force, OK. Yeah. So you moved around a lot when you were growing up? Yeah, about every three or four years, uh -huh. we'd have a new station, which uh, really didn't bother me that much. Um, I had a good time traveling. My brother now, he went through therapy for a while because people, psychiatrist says, well, the reason you're having trouble forming relationships is that your father moved around so much when you were a child. And I said, typical psychiatry, you know, blame yeah. your parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah. So you had a good childhood. Yeah. You liked yeah. your childhood. And you said you read a lot when you were a kid. Do you have, like, favorite books that you would read? Or I, mean, I got heavily into science fiction and fantasy maybe around, like, sixth grade, maybe mm -hmm. fifth grade. And I think my all-time favorite book is The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury, who I still consider a, a, just a terrific writer. Mm -hmm. um, and I also read a lot of Ursula K. Le Guin and Andre Norton, Isaac Asimov, all these folks. Uh -huh. Do you read now? My trouble right now is finding enough time to read for pleasure. You know, uh, also, when you do these historical books, 
you know, I end up uh, scanning. You know, I go first to the children's section in the library because those texts are, uh, there's a lot of photographs, there's a lot of illustrations, and the texts are simple so I can get an overview of a culture very quickly. And then from there I go to the adult section. If I still haven't found what I want, then it's a specialty library. And after that, if you still have questions, you got to track down an expert. But uh, because of that, I got in the habit of scanning, you know. And if you get into the habit of scanning a text, then it's very difficult to get back to reading for pleasure. Okay. Now, you had said scanning, and my first thought was computer, computer scanning. Sc so, so you mean... No, I mean rapid review of text. Okay. You know, okay. what do I need here? And you, you take it out, you know. And if you want to read something for fun, like last book I read that I really enjoyed was Philip Pullman's uh, series, uh, uh, Golden Compass and uh, Subtle Knife. Well, Subtle Knife, I started getting busy, you know, with deadlines, and all of a sudden I found myself going, brum, brum, brum. <laughs> and his stuff is too good to do that. Yeah. You know, you're not doing yourself a service with a really great writer like him uh, if you're reading it that quickly. Mm -hmm. so. Have you met other um, authors and illustrators like yourself that have uh, yeah, I've, I've, uh, no, we missed each other, but I left a copy of Golem for him, and then he sent me a copy of Subtle Knife, which was oh. kind of nice to do. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I've met a, a, a few people, and, you know, they're almost uniformly very nice folk. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we are working for children, so we don't have a tendency to attract sociopaths in this profession, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, your, your, one of your books won the Caldecott Award. Yeah, yeah, it kept us in the business. Yeah, do I have a copy of Golem here? I know. You would mind handing me that one? Yeah. There we go. Yeah, Golem is uh, it's a 400-year-old uh, Jewish legend, and it's actually the first uh, authentic folktale. So this is my first retelling. The other ones have been original stories. And uh, it's a pretty dark tale. You know, it's about a rabbi who creates a giant out of clay to protect the Jews of Prague from harm. And um, he... Um, animates this giant and it takes on the mobs that would have uh, persecuted the Jews in, in Prague. Um, so this is a story that grows out of prejudice and social dysfunction and uh, because of that it has you know very dark roots you know to it. And uh, when it won the Caldecott I got a little bit of carping you know from folks saying this is too grim a tale for, uh, for a, a children's audience which um, I disagree with, otherwise I wouldn't have done it, obviously. But the thing of it is, I think the people that carp the most about it um, have to realize that children's books have changed a great deal over the last 15 years. You know, there's a lot more range to them now. There's a lot more sophistication to them now. So this is a book that is definitely for an older elementary reader. I would say maybe fourth grade, then on up. And this gets used all the way through middle school, too. So. Um, I didn't have a whole lot of patience with, the, with that particular criticism because, uh, number one, of the range that is grown in picture books. And also, you've got to give credit to kids for thinking. You know, they can take uh, a lot more in a story. They can take a, a more uh, dense and meat and potatoes story than a lot of people give them credit for. You know, not everybody's going to be Mr. Bear climbed the tree and he smelled honey and smelled bad. You know, it's not all going to be that way. Yeah. You see, so. yeah. Well, Smoky Night was, is, was a powerful book too. It's yeah, Smoky Night got a lot of criticism. That was probably one of the most controversial Caldecott choices on the basis of story. Um, um, you know, and, and some people liked it, some people didn't, but then again it's a free country too, so yeah. if you don't like it, you don't have to read it. Well, tell us about, um, I know when the ALA group that announces the Caldecott, they give a phone call to the winner. Yeah, you only find out one hour before um, um, their press conference, uh -huh. you know, so it was President's Day, I think it was February 19, yeah, and um, uh, get a call, my wife answered the phone, and she said, you're going to want to take this, and uh, it was the uh, head of the committee saying that I won the Caldecott. Mm -hmm. I said, man, great, you know, because um, uh, that's, you know, the biggest honor you can get in, in children's picture books as an artist, and um, they said, can you make the press, press conference, because ALA was meeting in D.C., and we live in Frederick, Maryland, which is about maybe 40 miles away. And I said, well, we can try, you know, so we just, we piled into the car. And because it was a federal holiday, there wasn't a lot of traffic, which is good, because D.C.'s a mess, you know, on, on a regular day. And um, we made it down there for about the last 15 minutes of the press conference. And uh, I hadn't shaved, you know, and uh, my wife had two different color stockings on, and, 
no backings to her earrings, so she's meeting people like this. You know, Hi, how you doing? <laughs> Hi, how you doing? Like that, you know. And um, and then they ship you out to the Today Show. Mm. Wow. Well, because you know the the Newberry and Caldecott winners, you know, do that. And I must admit, I don't care for Katie Couric that much, <laughs> you know, really, because I mean, she did the thing that I just talked to you about is that she carped about this being too grim a tale. And uh, the way I figure it, all I did was a good job and someone liked it and they gave me a prize. Thank you very much. You know. Um, but uh, she said, oh, these illustrations are just fantastic. Really, really like these illustrations. I said, thank you very much. She said, but this story full of oppression, repression, and death, you say this is suitable for third and fourth graders? You know. So um, I just do what politicians do. I ignored the question and gave a standard answer. You know, I just, uh, I, I just mentioned what I had before that, you know, picture books have grown in range. You know, I, afterward I thought, gee, why didn't I say something more trenchant? Like, if you have a problem with this tale, why not bring it up with the 400 years of Jewish parents who brought it forward over the centuries? You know, that would have been yeah. a nice one, yeah. you know. But, you know, I figure, let it go. Mm -hmm. You know, because those who are, gonna, who are gonna enjoy the story, find it thought-provoking, they're going to be there. Those who don't like the story, you're never going to change their minds, mm -hmm. you know. So it's a matter of you do the best job you can, and then you release it and hope it finds its audience, mm -hmm. you know. And then you just go on from there to the next one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your other books um, that you have with the cut paper mm -hmm. before um, Gollum mm -hmm. are also folk tales? You They're folkloric. Folk you know, the uh, Golem is a genuine folk tale. But uh, stories like uh, Sunjata, uh, The Lion King of Mali, and uh, The Warrior and the Wise Man, which was the very first book, uh, these are called uh, folkloric stories because they have the trappings of folk tale, but uh, in many cases they're original. Now, I need to correct myself now that I think, <laughs> what a nice concept, is that this is actually a biography, this one. Sunjana actually did live in Mali. He was the founder of the Mali Empire. So this qualifies as a biography here. So Warrior Wise Man, Rain Player, these are, these are books that are folkloric. Okay. And, and I ask that because I notice in reading about it, it's described as an original folktale. Indeed. And yeah. the definition of a folktale is that it comes from another country and is uh, indeed authentic. Well, I do that for several reasons. First of all, just because a folktale is authentic does not automatically mean it's going to say anything to a modern audience. So that is why I construct an original tale to make sure that it has a point that a modern audience is going to find worthwhile, okay? But at the same time, that point cannot rupture the culture that is sponsoring it. It has to be a tale that could have happened mm -hmm. within that culture. And so, for instance, Warrior Wise Man, it's a story about the uh, triumph of uh, wisdom over brute force. That is better to think your way through a problem instead of fight your way through a problem. And Japan was the perfect place to put that because in the 14th century you had the samurai knights coming into power this, uh, in this, at the same time as Buddhism, which in its early stages relied much more on thought and, and wisdom to solve problems. Rain player is about thinking for yourself. And I found that the Maya were an extremely fatalistic people. You know, they believed in fate. If anything was going to happen, then it was going to happen, and there was nothing you could do about it. So I chose this culture to feature a young rebel who goes against that concept, because every culture has its rebels. And he breaks the idea that fate controls all, and he triumphs and saves his entire village, you see, by bringing the rain um, from the rain god. So. Um, <clears throat> That's how I worked. Um, it has to be, you know, um, a, a tale that could have been sponsored by that culture, you see. Mm -hmm. And that gives me the opportunity to speak to a modern audience. Mm -hmm. There's one more thing, too. When you create an original story, then you can highlight those portions of the culture that are important for the tale. And not all authentic tales do that, because their everyday life was so common that they didn't take notice of it you see. Yeah. But uh, when you do an original story, you can pick and choose those important elements of everyday cultural life that enriches and enlivens the tale. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're wonderful. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. thanks. And I can tell you did a lot of research on, on getting the background and everything for them. Yeah, so. yeah. I do, I do a ton of research. 
Uh, actually, I brought sketches from the first book, if you want to see, because Ooh, yes. the, the story on the first book was I had been doing freelance for about three years, and a friend told me about a one-day class I could take in picture books. And I went to it, and there was a former editor there named Dillis Evans. And uh, she really liked my portfolio. She said, um, I'm going to give you the names and numbers of four publishers in New York. You can tell them I sent you. Wow. That'll be good for five minutes, is what she said. <laughs> so you better be ready. You better go up with your art and a story, because that way you'll be an illustrator with something you want to do. So I came up with this original story of the warrior and the wise man, where you have twin sons of the emperor, one the greatest warrior, the other the greatest wise man. And because their father can't choose between them who's going to run the country next, he sets up a contest where they have to gather the five magic elements that the world is made of. And each one of those elements is guarded by one of these huge creatures and his army. Now, it looks like the warrior is going to win through the use of force, but it backfires on him because the armies of those five creatures end up surrounding the castle and totally overwhelming his capacity to deal with them. So it's the wise man who saves the day. Even though he hasn't won all the elements, he takes the one his brother stole, gives them back one by one, and then drives the invading armies away without hurting a soul. And when the emperor sees this, he says, yes, strength is vital, but it must be used wisely. And because of that, the wise man will rule. Well, when I got to New York, my first appointment, the editor really liked my art, and she liked the story. She said, you sold yourself a book. Yeah, <laughs> first appointment. It was great. Cool. And I said, but there's one problem. You know, I've never done a book, so where do you start? And she said, you just draw it out as best you can, and then we'll go from mm -hmm. there. So this is what the first book first looked like right here. These are the very first sketches. Ten years old, these, so be respectable. No, anyway, um, I uh, colored everything in with marker. I typed up my story, and I put it in place. I even showed samples of all the different colored papers I was going to use. And I went to the library and did my research. And I have all my research notes and sources put down here. Because that way, when the editor asked me about the accuracy of samurai swords, Buddhist temples, all that other type of stuff, I could say, yeah, I've got photographs. Look, see, I did it right. See? Now, when I first put this together, you know, I didn't have any technical training. You know, I didn't have a college training or art school training. So I just did the best I could. I looked at other people's picture books, you know, see how they did stuff. And I saw that most folks did the same thing. They put a picture on the left and a picture on the right. So I did too. And then I had a tendency to split up my story a lot to follow along. So in this case, I put the story in a big white block right here, and then a smaller space over on the right-hand side here. Well, I packed all this off to my editor, and she took a look at it. And she said, you got a lot of really good ideas here, but can I make some suggestions? And I said, sure. She said, well, first of all, instead of putting one picture on the left and another one on the right, could you make one big picture going all the way across? I said, yeah. <laughs> but why? And she said, well, your story has so much action that it needs more room. You see, if you've got everything separate here, then your action's all boxed in. But if you make a double-page spread going all the way across, then you've got plenty of room for it to flow through. I said, okay, I'll do that. She said, well, if you do, then you've got to get rid of these white spaces because they're going to get in the way. I said, okay. And she said, also, you can't split it up anymore because that makes your book really hard to read. Now, sometimes, and I found this out in other books, you know, you can split it evenly up top or evenly down bottom, but usually you keep all the words in one place because it just gives you more room for picture and it's easier to read. And I said, okay, I can do all this stuff, but um, now I have a question. You want so many changes here. You know, you want one picture instead of two. You want all these words together in one place. Does that mean I have to do this stuff all over again? And she said, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want you to do it all over again because this isn't close enough to what the book needs. And I said, well, man, that's dandy. You know, I spent a lot of time on this. What can I do to make this easier? And she said, not much. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I can mention two things. She said, first of all, don't color, you know, because coloring takes time. She said, always do your sketches first in black and white. It won't take you so long. And another thing, don't type up your story and stick it in here. And that totally mystified me. I said, why? I thought that would be a help. She said, well, not really. She said, uh, isn't this the first time you wrote your story? I said, yeah. She said, that's called your first draft. And I said, I still can't believe I said this. So? <laughs> she said, well, that means I take out a red pencil. I mark it up, you know, with changes I want made. I said, oh, I knew that. 
<laughs> sort of. <laughs> well, really learned a lot, you know, but it was also extremely disappointing because I thought I'd done a pretty good job here. And then it turned out there was all this new stuff I had to learn. Mm -hmm. So this is what I did next. And this is how I do all the books now. I always start off with a black and white sketch. This one is from a new book called Workshop by Andrew Clements. And it's short poems about tools for very young readers. And right here, it's starting off as a black and white sketch. Um, you can see above the word chisel, there's a little art director note. And it says, move text right, I think. What is it? Excuse me a moment. Move text block. Yeah, because under the word chisel is going to go a few more words about what the chisel does. And it's too close to the middle of the book, you see? See that line going down the middle? That's the gutter. That's what they call it in the middle of the book. That gets sewn up when they manufacture it. So if you have anything too close there, it gets, you know, it disappears. So I moved everything there about a half inch, maybe three quarters of an inch to the right. See? And that's about the only thing that changed on that because the completed piece is right here. like that. And you can see it hardly changed at all from the original black and white sketch. Now, I was on a really tight time schedule on this. Usually, I color in my sketches. And that way, the editor knows exactly what the book's going to look like as much as possible. Also helps me, too, because uh, I can more easily choose the colored papers I'm going to use you know, for each piece. Um, now, the way I get the layering here is really pretty simple. Behind each part of the art, I put little sections of this white board that the whole thing's mounted on. And that's called foam core. It's styrofoam with paper on both sides. So when you put pieces of that behind parts of the art, that bumps it forward and it makes a layer. And that way, when this gets photographed, all those layers cast shadows. See? To stick stuff together, I don't use glue because it's too easy for it to fall on the page and make a spot. So I use uh, double stick photo mounts and foam tape. And those dry adhesives hold everything together. And it's just all pressed into place and all stays put. See? And then it gets photographed for, for reproduction. I have a 4 by 5 transparency made. Now, one time I was talking to a kindergarten class about, about how this gets into a book. And I asked these guys, uh, well, who knows how this gets into a book? You know, and there was just general confusion for a moment. And this little kid uh, said, um, said, yeah, oh, and that's, what, that's what it was. Excuse me, let me back up. This little kid raised his hand during Q&A, and he said, OK, I get it. He was acting like Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes, really. It was oh, disturbing. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, he said, I get it. Your artwork is real thick. Well, then, how do you cram it into this real skinny book? You know, he's going to give me a hard time about it. You know? Luckily, his friend sitting next to him raised his hand. He said, man, are you dumb. Says, I know how he gets this flat. He jumps on it. You know? But no, photography is so much easier. Okay. Yeah. And what's back here? That's have, just that's the, just the, the words. Uh, oh, the words haven't got. Well, actually, I did put the words on here, just on the tracing paper. Uh, this was just uh, putting in the uh, galley. That is the uh, size and style of type that is going to be actually used in the book. And I put this into my uh, leave the area in the sketches to make sure that all the elements clear it, you know, so there's nothing interfering with the type. And it's very important to have your galleys before you start uh, doing your final art, because you need to adjust the space to make sure that nothing interferes with um, somebody being able to read your book, you know. You have to leave, leave enough breathing space around the type, you see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is this a picture from that book also? No, this is Tough Cookie here. Oh, wait. Should we talk about that now? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, we this can talk about exciting. anything at any time. <laughs> okay. Um, tough Cookie uh, came about. Let me see if I can you find a sketch here on this, too. Just one moment. Tough Cookie came about because um, I heard the phrase tough cookie when I was a kid. Tough cookie meant a tough guy. Also means a stale cookie. So I put the two together. I thought, what if a bunch of stale cookies got together at the bottom of a cookie jar, started a town down there? Now, what would it be like? And I thought it would look like 1940s New York. You know, it had cheap hotels, neon signs, little manhole covers with steam coming out, little cabs and cop cars and all that stuff. So here's one of the first sketches for Tough Cookie right here. And um, this is all done in color marker, the same size as necessary. Uh, you can see the line I put in for the gutter down the middle. And you can also see the text block on the lower left 
that I put in there to handle the type. Okay? Now, the reason I went full color on these sketches when I first sent them in, this was the first comedy that I had tried, that I'd had accepted by a publisher. And this was a complete 180 for me. I've done a lot of historical stuff, and here I am doing this screwball comedy. Alrighty. Uh, actually, The Secret Knowledge of Grown Ups was the second comedy that was accepted, but it came out first. And then this one was accepted first, but it came out after Secret Knowledge of Grown Ups. So I went ahead and did in color. And that way, the editor could feel really comfortable that I knew what I was doing in a completely new genre of book. All right. Mm -hmm. So anyway, in this, he says, uh, I'm a tough, they call me a tough cookie. I guess I am. Came from a regular batch, lots of dough. Used to live the high life, top of the jar. Then I hit bottom, stayed there. Life's tough, still is, but I'm a tough cookie. And you see these little guys running out of the uh, alleyway here? Actually, you can see them better on this piece. This is the, one of the actual constructions right here. Here they are. These are the crumbs, OK? Because <laughs> what else is at the bottom of a cookie jar? Tough Cookie says, some people call them crumbs. I call them friends. Anybody gives them a tough time, I step in. Okay. Here's the story. His girlfriend, Pecan Sandy, tells him that his friend on the police force, Chips, has been injured by fingers. Fingers is the hand coming in the top of the jar, see? So at the end of this, you got Tough Cookie and the Crumbs versus Fingers. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, I can't wait till that book is Yeah, up. it's a real cliffhanger, yeah. <laughs> um, now, this book is a little bit, um, um, the, the technique is exactly the same as the historical books, but um, I, it's just used for comedic purposes. And uh, it's, it's really nice to do comedies, uh -huh. you know, because it shows I've got some range, you know, mm -hmm. because if you're not careful, uh, like in any other profession, you can get um, uh, pigeonholed, mm -hmm. you know, as only being capable of one thing. Yeah. So it was nice to try comedies and, and, and get a nice reception on yeah. them. Yeah. Well, speaking of comedies, you have one other book we really didn't talk about too much, and we only have a little bit of time, mm -hmm. but The Secret Knowledge of Grown-Ups. Oh, yeah. Just well, hold that book up and Yeah, well, quickly. The Secret Knowledge of Grown-Ups are all the real reasons why parents tell kids to do things. You know, it's been kept secret for thousands of years, and I'm the first rogue grown-up to put it all together in book form and unleash it upon the innocent children of America, see? So very irresponsible on my part. But um, so here's one of the examples. Uh, top secret grown-up rule, I think it's number 56. Yeah. Don't blow bubbles in your milk. The official reason is it is noisy, sloppy, and rude. But of course, that's just the official reason. That's not the truth. The truth is, if you blow down a straw the wrong way into milk, it reverses its molecular action, creates a vacuum, sucks your face right into the glass. Ah. And parents just don't tell you about it. No. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> but uh, this had an interesting history in that, um, I gave it to my editor at Clarion, and she didn't care for it. You know, she just didn't like it. She said it was stand-up humor and uh, didn't have a chance of being uh, visually rendered, mm -hmm. you know. And so I gave it to uh, Lothrop, uh, another publisher, mm -hmm. and they really liked it. Oh, good. And it came out. Now we have it. Didn't change a word, and uh, it's been selling pretty briskly and got signed for television production two months ago, too. Oh, cool. Ooh. So, Next yeah. year, I get to be executive producer on a television show. Uh -huh. Wow. That means I get to wear a flowered shirt and say, hey, baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's all we have time for today. OK. I'm, I'm really sorry. We could talk to you forever and listen to your stories and look at your artwork. Well, thank this you. is David Wisniewski, mm -hmm. and we're at the Red Balloon Bookshop, and this is all about kids. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Goodbye.